them all once a month. And this is the last year they're going to do it, too. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Great. Let's bring the bell and I'll make a comment and we'll get started. Anybody remember the story about walking across the desert with a backpack and gathering all the things and then coming to the Rocky Mountains and climbing up the Rocky Mountains and having to throw all your rocks out and everything you've gathered and then climb down the other side and find the same rocks on the other side? Yeah. Did anybody not remember that story except for Amanda? I remember. You remember? That's a story of way, 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 way back. And everybody has been hearing when we've been reading the Osho book, you know how he, he says, just drop it? Does everybody know what he's saying when he means drop it? Or he says, just let go? Is that what he says in his book? That's the theme of his book, isn't it? That's the theme of the whole book of secrets. Anyway, um, Chris was telling me that um, the reason that Stan and Jennifer don't like coming to class is because of what? Oh, um, I didn't want to say it. I want to let Chris tell you. They they think that you put. <laughs> they think that you um, put down other religions. And Stan was saying, why can't he just talk about some of them and not put down other religions? And I don't agree with what Stan said, but I'm just telling you. Yes, yeah, right. What did Jennifer? <laughs> what did Jennifer say? Something. I haven't spoken to oh. Jennifer. That was and. Stan said that Jennifer feels the same way, supposedly. Right. So. Okay. Anyway, let me read the definition of what religion <coughs> is. A set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. The purpose of the universe, okay? Especially when considered as the creation of a superhuman agency or agencies, usually involving devotional and ritual observances, and often containing a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs. That's true. Is that sort of what religion is? Of course. Um, okay, now, when does anybody see a correlation between the backpack and the rock story? Does anybody know what the rocks are? What, Steve? Beliefs. Belief? Ideas. And ideas? Correct the correct ideas, right? The moral code, the correct ideas, the way the condition of the universe should be, right? Right. Um, does anybody see a correlation between the Book of Secrets when Osho says drop it or just let it go? What would you say, Bernie? Yeah, I mean, those are all the the correct ideas that we've got in our backpacks that we're taking along with us that we think we need to have to be happy or satisfied. Does anybody remember the story about the filter? Yeah. What's the story about the filter, Donna? Well, since I've been experiencing it for all these years, since I've been in some, it's like we go, we reach a point and we go through a filter and anything that it's not able to go through the filter, drops off. If, if, you, if, if you really do drop it, right? Yeah. Do you think many people drop many things, Bernie, in reality? No, very few. They just change the words, right? Yeah, they just change it around, rearrange it. It's sort of mm -hmm. like rearranging furniture in your house. Right. Do they join a different religion if they don't like the one that they're in? Yeah, they do that. I mean... And if you know if this doesn't work and stuff, they just pick this set of um, <coughs> things to um, become religious about, right? Yeah, like you know, someone I had worked with the Western Digital, she I think left the Catholic Church because she liked the, uh, Judaism. And so she took up that set of codes, right? And set of rocks, 
And is, does Osho say that you should gather more of those, or does he say drop them? He says drop as much as you can. Now, in the in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Buddhists call them propensities. Is there any difference between propensities and religion, Al? Um, no. Same thing, aren't they? Uh -huh. Except it's just a different way of saying it. The reason I think they said it in the Tibetan Book of the Dead is propensities because everybody probably hearing it was a Buddhist. And they were saying, okay, you got all these propensities in the Buddhist religion, just drop them. He calls them jealousy and desire and anger, hatred, anger and hatred. And propensities, right? Mm -hmm. And propensities are the, the correct ideas, yeah? Mm -hmm. The way things yeah. should be. And, yeah. and so what usually happens is everybody goes along and everything is fine until they come to um, their Bardo photo when they, when they die. And they, um, like Donna said here, she's been going through um, the filter for her whole lifetime and she's got everything cleaned up. So when she gets ready to um, go to the other side, you know. Drop, because Donna, I don't, how old are you, Donna? 61. 61? Donna probably hasn't got 50 more years, do you think, Chad? Do you probably think she'll be able to lift 111? Probably not. Probably not. The odds are against it, don't you think? Yeah. So she's probably got about 49 years left, maybe 110, yeah. you know? In the next 49 years, she'll probably get rid of the rest of the stuff, and so she won't have to worry about when she gets to the other side of, um, you know, she'll have gotten it all cleaned up, don't you think, Ron? Don't you think Donna's made dramatic changes between the first time when she came here and now? <laughs> Be honest. No. You don't? Think it's the same, Donna? I think a lot of us, myself included, have looked at a lot of things, dealt with a lot of things, rearranged our rationalization of a lot of things, but by and large, there's not a, myself personally, I can't speak for Donna personally, I've made some incremental changes, but I wouldn't say anything but right home about it. <laughs> right. So <laughs> now, don't you think that's why the Buddhists say that you had eight million four hundred thousand incarnations already, and, and just another world ready to go, <laughs> and another one is going to be eight hundred eight million four hundred thousand and one incarnations. So it's just another one, right? And so there's really no dramatic um, necessity to make any change, is there, Al? No, it, it's funny that we can relate to the Iliad, which is written centuries ago, where there's stories in the Bible, because change comes in increments, just like you said. You know, it's very small, it's nothing, nothing big changes, nothing, nothing changes unless it's a life threatening situation or something, you know. Nothing changes very dramatically. It's very small. I know you would like us to change in, in giant steps. You try to do it, do that to us, but it doesn't work. It doesn't well, work. I, I agree with you. D this place is a place of exposure for change. It's an opportunity, and there's not a, uh, and there's not a crowd knocking at the door. Would you say, Steve, I don't see a line out there for you to get in? It's not a, an inner a thing. That's not doesn't seem interesting to the majority of the people in Salt Lake or anywhere or online or whatever to, to um, do get rid of their backpack of rocks. It doesn't have mass appeal. It doesn't have mass appeal to drop the, the shopping, the whatever, you know. All the propensities, or any propensities, or anything like that. It's, it's 
um, people seem to be headed in the other direction, don't they? I just got a, le a lecture across the street from Cindy, I think her name is, or Mindy, or what's that little girl across the street's name? Anybody know? Cindy. Huh? Cindy. Cindy, I went over there to fill their M&M machine, and she told me that we were bad people for wanting to take down the Ten Commandments. And I said, we don't want to take down the Ten Commandments, we just want to put ours up next to them. And she couldn't even hear me. I told her ten times. You're trying to take down the Ten Commandments? I said, no, we're not. We want them up. We want ours next to them. She couldn't, couldn't hear me. <laughs> it was unbelievable. She couldn't hear me. She already had her mind made up. She had her religion about it. That the Ten Commandments ought to be on every courthouse step. And Judge Moore ought to be the next Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> and Steve's dad gets to be second in command. Right? A Southern Baptist. He's a follower, so... He's following. <laughs> anyway... People, things, how does that, things, things that don't change things to tend to remain the same. That's how it goes. Yeah, things that don't change tend to remain the same. But everything really does change because everything is changing gradually. But it's a, it's a slow thing. And just because some people are at a different point of change than other people, do you think you ought to hold it against them, Shad? Oh, come on, you ought to flog them. Don't you think they do that? <clears throat> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it happens, yeah. Like, you know, the witches, you know, in Salem and stuff, those people are a little bit different, right? Right, well, I'm They found moles on those women. When if they had oh, a that's mole... That's true, that's true. Right? They There's no defending that. They, so. they, they deserve um, being... Um, thumb screws put on and put in those blocks and stuff like that until the mole went away. The mole went, didn't go away, they got to take off all their clothes and look at them and look for mole moles, you know. And if they found a second mole, they got to kill them. Good Christians, right? Because they had a, a set a moral code about moles. Moles are bad. They're contagious. Pardon? Moles are contagious. Are they? I don't know. Could be. Bethers has a mole on top of her head. I I've been rubbing on it. Anyway, I wanted to read the definition of religion. And then another thing that I wanted to do is, in the Bardo here, it talks about, you know, the Buddha on the other side and the Guru and stuff like that. You know, there's only going to be one person in reality there, and that's going to be you and the Bardo on the other side, and it's going to be the way you perceive it. You may perceive the Guru or the Buddha, or me, or whatever there, you know, with a concert and everything. But it's going to be what's in your mind, or in your essence, what you see. And if you can see it for what it really is, then you can make some changes. If you can, if you see it with all your propensities in your religion, you'll, everything will be okay. You'll just get another deck of cards like Al got, or you got in this last lifetime your deal because you're the one that's going to decide the cards with your religion your religion will decide it for you anyway that's all I had to say can I yeah can I get a quick review of the Vox story because I may have been gone when you were telling me all right it, everybody goes across the um, and life is like going across the desert and you got a backpack, and as you go, you gather all the things you think you need, and you pick up all the beautiful rocks, and you put them in your pack. And when you get to the Rocky Mountains of Denver, you start up the hill, and you get about halfway up, and you say, hey, this is a heavy load, so you throw a rock out. You get a little further up when the elevation is hard to breathe, so you throw out a bunch more rocks. By the time you get to the top, you throw out all the rocks because you couldn't carry them all. They were so heavy. Mm -hmm. Then you start down the other side, mm -hmm and you find the same rocks on the other side, on this side, and you start collecting them again because you're going downhill and it's easy. When the going gets tough, you unload, and when it's easy, you load back up. That's religion, the rocks. Propensities, beliefs, 
Is Pilar online? Oh. We don't have the chatterbox going, that's right. Okay. Anyway, Pilar, that's religion. That's why I told everybody to get rid of religion. Now, not just you. I'm talking to everybody. Or ideas or beliefs. The more things that you believe and learn about and get into a construct, the greater prison you create for yourself. Yes? I was just wondering if we might talk a little more about this on Saturday. Because I have yeah. some questions. And yeah. I, I know we want to start yep. reading. We'll do it okay. on Saturday. Yeah, we'll cover it. <clears throat> we left off on 193, the general conclusion. By the reading of these properly, those devotees or yogis who are advanced in understanding can make the best use of the transference at the moment of death. They need not traverse the intermediate state, but will depart by the great straight upward path. Others who are a little less practiced in things spiritual, recognizing the clear light in the Chonyad Bardo at the moment of death, will go by the upward course. Those lower than these will be liberated in accordance with their particular abilities and karmic connections. When one or other of the peaceful and wrathful deities dawneth upon them during the succeeding two weeks while in the Chonyad Bardo, there being several turning points, uh, footnote, or narrow paths or ambuscades, liberation should be obtained at one or other of them without through recognition but those of very weak karmic connection, whose mass of obscurations is great because of evil actions, have to wander downwards and downwards to the Siddha Bardo. Yet since there are, like the rungs of a ladder, many kinds of settings face to face or remindings, liberation should have been obtained at one or at another by recognizing. But those of the weakest karmic connections, by not recognizing, fall under the influence of awe and terror. For them, there are various graded teachings for closing the womb door and for selecting the womb door. <clears throat> and at one or other of these, they should have apprehended the method of visualization and apply the illimitable virtues thereof for exalting one's own condition. Even the lowest of them, resembling the brute order, will have been able, in virtue of the application of the refuge, to turn from entering into misery and obtaining the great boon of a perfectly endowed and freed human body. Footnote. A perfectly endowed and freed human body, freed implying freedom from the eight thraldoms. One, the ever recurring round of pleasure concomitant with existence as a deva. Two, the incessant warfare concomitant with existence as an asura. Three, the helplessness and slavery concomitant with existence under conditions like those prevailing in the world of brutes. Four, the torments of hunger and thirst concomitant with existence as a preta. Five, the extremes of heat and cold concomitant with existence in hell. Six, the irreligion or perverted religion concomitant with existence among certain races of mankind. Or seven, the physical or eight other impediments concomitant with certain sorts of human birth. To win a perfectly endowed human body, one must inherently possess faith, perseverance, intellect, sincerity, and humility as a religious devotee, and be born at a time when religion prevails, i.e. when an enlightened one shall be incarnate, or when his teachings are the driving force of the world, and meet then a great spiritually developed guru. Will, in the next birth, meeting with a guru who is a virtuous friend, obtain the saving vows? If this doctrine arrive while one is in the Siddha Bardo, it will be like the connecting up of good actions, resembling thus the place of a trough in the break of a broken drain. Such is this teaching. Footnote. If a drain be broken, the continuity in the flow of the water is broken. The teaching is, in its effects, like repairing the drain by insertion of a trough to conduct the water through the break, which is symbolical of the break in the stream of consciousness caused by death. Thereby is the merit of good deeds done in the human world made to carry the deceased forward. Continuity is reestablished. 
those of heavy evil karma cannot possibly fail to be liberated by hearing this doctrine and recognizing. If it be asked why, it is because at th that time all the peaceful and wrathful deities being present to receive one, and the Maras and the interpreters likewise coming to receive one along with them, the mere hearing of this doctrine then turneth one's views, and liberation is obtained. For there is no flesh and blood body to depend upon, but a mental body which is easily affected. At whatever distance one may be wandering in the bardo, one heareth and cometh, for one possesseth the slender sense of supernormal perception and foreknowledge, and recollecting and apprehending instantaneously, the mind is capable of being changed or influenced. Therefore is it the teaching of great use here. It is like the mechanism of a catapult. Wow, that word is in here. <laughs> amazing. Isn't that amazing? Okay. And there's a footnote. As a catapult enables one to direct a great stone at a definite target or goal, so this doctrine enables the deceased to direct himself to the goal of liberation. It is like the moving of a wooden beam or log which is a hundred men which a hundred men cannot carry, but which by being floated upon water can be towed wherever desired in a moment. Another footnote. As water makes the moving of the beam possible, so this doctrine makes possible the conducting of the deceased to the place or state of existence most appropriate, or even to Buddhahood. It is like the controlling of a horse's mouth by the means of a bridle. Footnote, as with a bridle, controlling the bit and the course of the horse, so with this doctrine, the deceased can be directed or turned in his after-death progression. Therefore, going near the body of one who hath passed out of this life, if the body be there, impress this upon the spirit of the deceased vividly again and again, until blood and the yellowish water secretion begin to issue from the nostrils. At that time, the corpse should not be disturbed. The rules to be observed for this impressing to be efficacious are no animal should be slain on account of the deceased. Footnote. This does not refer to animal sacrifice for the dead, but to the non-Buddhist habit of slaying animals to provide meat for the lamas and the guests at the house of death while the funeral rites are being conducted. Unfortunately, this prohibition is often overlooked. And, though no killing of animals may take place there, slaughtered animals may be brought from a distance and observance after the letter, but not in the spirit of this Buddhist precept of non-killing. Nor should relatives weep or make mournful wailings near the dead body. Footnote. Wailings and lamentations have been customary amongst Tibetans and related Himalayan peoples, as amongst the peoples of India and of Egypt since immemorial times, but Buddhism, like the Islamic faith, discountenances both them. Let the family perform virtuous deeds as far as possible. Footnote. Such deeds are, for example, the feeding of lamas and of the poor, almsgiving, the presentation of religious texts or images to monasteries, and the endowment of monasteries if the deceased left much wealth. In other ways, too, this great doctrine of the Bardo Thodol, as well as any other religious texts, may be expounded to the dead or dying. If this doctrine be joined to the end of the guide and recited along with the guide, it becometh very efficacious. In yet other ways, it should be recited as often as possible. The words and meanings should be committed to memory by everyone, and when death is inevitable and the death symptoms are recognized, strength permitting, one should recite it oneself and reflect upon the meanings. If strength doth not permit, then a friend should read the book and impress it vividly. There is no doubt as to its liberating. The doctrine is one which liberateth by being seen without need of meditation or of sadhana. There's a footnote perfect, perfected devotion, which ordinarily requires the very careful performance of a ritual more or less technical and elaborate. This profound teaching liberateth by being heard or by being seen. This profound teaching liberateth those of great evil karma through the secret pathway. 
one should not forget its meaning and the words, even though pursued by seven mastiffs. And there's a footnote. Fierce mastiffs are numerous in most Tibetan villages, and travelers protect themselves by special charms against them. This reference to seven mastiffs is purely Tibetan and is additional internal evidence that the Bardo Thodol took form in, the Tibet, in Tibet itself, deriving much of its matter from Indian mythology and systems of yoga philosophy. You have a, a master here that will protect you. <laughs> By this select teaching, one obtain a Buddhahood at the moment of death. Were the Buddhas of the three times, the past, the present, and the future, to seek, they could not find any doctrine transcending this. Thus is completed the profound heart drops of the Bardo doctrine, called the Bardo Thodol, which liberateth embodied beings. Here endeth the Tibetan Book of the Dead.